Good evening. Thank you all for being here tonight. This is an exciting topic. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Mayor Maria Marino, and walking around and shaking hands is Council Member Mark Marciano. We were both here this morning for the presentation, and we're excited to be back again this evening. We have a wonderful presentation for you. I'm going to let Natalie do her thing and introduce everybody because she's got all the histories and the bios, and I'm just winging it up here. So <laughs> thank you very much. Enjoy. And it is being live streamed, so hopefully we do well. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, everybody. My name is Natalie Crowley. I'm the Director of Planning and Zoning for the City of Palm Beach Gardens. Uh, we are here this evening to keep the discussion going about transit and the city's very important uh, transit-oriented design initiative that we've been working on a lot over the last year. Uh, we had a workshop uh, last year about this time where we were able to engage uh, many residents uh, and mem many members of the business community. Uh, since that time, we've uh, worked on a plan and we have developed an economic development report. And that's why we really we're here this evening. Uh, we really want to present to you some of the findings of that report, and we want to be able to present to the residents who have come here this evening uh, some of the recommendations that have resulted from some of the data in the economic report. So we're excited that you're here. Thank you for taking the time out of your schedules this evening to be here. Um, this evening, we have a presentation uh, from Mr. Tom Lavash. Um, he is with WTL Plus A. It is a consulting firm, a real estate consulting firm, an economic development firm out of Washington, D.C. Joining him is Tom Moriarty. Uh, he is from our, uh, Retail and Development Strategies, which is based out of Arlington, um, as well, real estate uh, consulting firm specializing uh, in economic development. Uh, and the two gentlemen, the two Toms, we refer to them, uh, they're going to be presenting an overview of the economic analysis. We also have joining us this evening is uh, Dr. Kim Delaney. Uh, she is the, I want to get your title right, the Director of Strategic Development and Policy for the Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council. Uh, and we do thank the Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council, as always, for working in true partnership with the City of Palm Beach Gardens uh, on this very important initiative. Um, we do have the opportunity, certainly, for questions and answers. Uh, after the presentation, so we are more than happy to do this. Uh, we do have information on the city's public website as well. On the city's website, www.pbgfl.com, on the planning page, we have the entire 180 page. 141. Okay, so uh, 100 and 180 plus appendices, so about 300 page report, which we did not print uh, for the sake of saving trees and paper, but you do have access to that. Uh, 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 presentation. We also were able to present uh, a similar presentation to the business community this morning and the PowerPoint for that is on, posted on the city's website. So you don't need to write down everything that you see. We do have everything, all this information online if anybody's interested. Uh, so with that, I am going to turn this over to Kim. So thanks for the opportunity to present tonight. Uh, my name is Kim Delaney. I have the good fortune of working with the Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council. Uh, Mayor Marina is one of the council, uh, uh, council board members. Uh, the Planning Council is one of 10 regional planning councils in the state of Florida. We are tasked by state statute with uh, helping local governments with multi-jurisdictional challenges or unusual challenges like this one. Accommodating a train station is, um, is, a, is a complex process. And so the council exists as an extension to local government staff. We also exist as partners to the Florida Department of Transportation, to the South Florida Regional Transportation Authority, they operate Tri-Rail, um, and the Palm Beach Transportation Planning Agency, of which the mayor is also a member, uh, which is the planning agency um, in Palm Beach County. Um, so we're a facilitating agency. We have a 28-member board, uh, 18 elected officials, and 10 gubernatorial appointees. Um, and so uh, the, our role in this project, uh, the city of Palm Beach Gardens applied for and secured a grant uh, that was offered in the region for local governments that were identified for future stations along the FEC rail corridor. So I have a map that illustrates that for you. Um, I'm going to share the presentation tonight with Tom and Tom, who are down from, uh, from the Northeast. I'll cover an intro to the project, kind of on how, how we got here, and then Tom and Tom are going to take a dive into the details of the economics. As Natalie mentioned, 
and I'll hold this up for a second. There's a fairly substantial report on the city's websites, on the council's website as well. Um, and so this report details the entire public process, the background and the city's efforts to date uh, with respect to transportation and mobility, the city's mobility study that's underway. Um, it includes both a very detailed analysis of all the planning recommendations that we have, um, as well as um, the underpinnings for why those recommendations are there, and the complete market studies included in Appendix C, if you will, of that report. So the biggest section of the report is the market basis. So just for your knowledge, that's all available for you. <coughs> uh, with respect to station area, um, the focus for the study um, is looking at uh, the, uh, uh, where the city has long identified a future station just south of PGA Boulevard um, along the FEC corridor um, and just to the west of alternate A1A. So the station location is identified in that green circle on the map. Um, and the dotted area represents about a half mile radius around the station location. What we know from looking at transit systems across the country and the ones that operate in Florida is that every transit trip starts and stops as a pedestrian. When you get on the train or you get on the bus, Usually the destination isn't the train station, for example, but it's something near the train station. And so if we're going to be successful, both in creating a service that provides good access and mobility for residents and employees, but also one that really capitalizes on the investment that's represented by a train station, we try to really focus in and get it right in that half mile around the station, because that's the walk shed. Um, that's about a 10 minute walk for the average person. Um, and when we're planning TOD, we try to focus in on that area first and then connect to that area as well. What you can see in the, I'm gonna use this little mouse. Can you all see this little mouse moving on the screen? Yes, okay. Um, uh, and, so, and so the station location, of course, just south of PGA Boulevard, that red dashed line indicates the FEC rail corridor and the half mile takes us out past the FPNL property. It includes uh, really on the other side of I-95, but leading to I-95, the Lomans Plaza property, uh, what is called now PGA Station, the RCA BioCorp, um, it includes Legacy Place, um, and then even touches the Gardens Mall and downtown at the Gardens. So those properties become really the focus of um, the recommended infill, um, uh, infill uh, um, program that we have um, to touch on, and that's, what was, that's what's been tested in the, uh, in the corridor study. Uh, with respect to uh, geography of the region, <coughs> pardon me, this map illustrates the existing tri-rail service and the future service that's proposed on the FEC rail corridor. So the existing service starts up in Mangonia Park on what used to be called the CSX rail corridor, it actually was bought by the state when they began to operate tri-rail. It's now called the South Florida Rail Corridor. Um, and tri so tri-rail service runs from Mangonia Park all the way south on these blue and red lines into now Miami International Airport. So you can actually get on a train up here, you can roll your luggage out of the, um, out of the train at Miami International and onto a plane. Um, so that's the connectivity that we have today in the region. Um, Tri-Rail today has 18 stations in 72 miles. It carries 15 to 16,000 people a day. Um, just to give you an idea of what that means from a traffic standpoint, today's Tri-Rail, about 20,000 uh, cars a day fills one lane of traffic on I-95. So if you're riding on tri-rail and you look at the traffic thing and you think, thank God, I'm not in that traffic, well, you're on the tri-rail system. But if you're a commuter and you're not on the train, well, you have almost a lane of traffic that's being carried on a daily basis in the tri-rail system. So just give me an idea of how those two things correlate to one another. Uh, tr uh, all aboard Florida, of course, um, which is now called Brightline, uh, is operational on the FEC corridor. They introduced service in January from West Palm to Fort Lauderdale and then added the Miami extension in May. So Brightline, operates in these three station locations, downtown West Palm, downtown Fort Lauderdale, and downtown Miami. Prior to Brightline operating, Tri-Rail had long identified the FEC rail corridor as the corridor it wanted to be. In fact, when Tri-Rail was first established, it tried to develop on the FEC, but the FEC wasn't interested at that point in time. Um, and so the state shifted over and purchased the available corridor that it had to work with, which was the CSX. From a land use standpoint, it's not really the most desirable location uh, because what surrounds those stations isn't the historic land use pattern that we have for the most part extending up and down on the east coast of Florida. It's a much more suburban and kind of a driving condition. Um, so Tri-Rail has long identified extending service on the FEC corridor as a number one priority. It's also been the number one priority for the Palm Beach Transportation Agency or the TPA that I mentioned earlier as one of the agency partners. We c don't have enough room to add all the lanes necessary to move all the traffic in South Florida. Um, and so to avoid that and create more choices, the TPA has identified extending tri-rail service over onto this FEC as a, as a top priority long term, as has the state. Um, and so that service actually will begin in um, about September of next year 
Tri-Rail trains are going to begin service into downtown Miami. There's a new piece of track that's already been constructed, this green line um, that has already uh, been finished, and Tri-Rail's in the process of actually building a station platform in what is called Miami Central, which is Brightline Station in downtown Miami. Um, so as of September of next year, those 50 trains a day will continue to operate, but 26 of them will switch over onto this new track and go directly into downtown Miami. 24 of them will have, um, uh, uh, those 26 trains will have a connecting train that meets riders um, in, uh, um, in uh, the uh, transfer station and continue south into uh, Miami International. 24 trains will do the opposite. They'll continue directly south into the airport and a connector train will meet riders who are actually heading to downtown Miami. So that service will begin in September of next year. Um, Tri-Rail and Miami-Dade County are already working on extending that service up to about Midtown, if you're familiar with Miami, the Midtown district. And then there are a series of phases that are being identified on the corridor. One of those phases is extending service north to Jupiter. Again, that's been a top priority for the TPA. To accommodate that service, there's already a new piece of track that's been constructed around 25th Street. So if you're familiar with the Northwood district, there's a new piece of track that's been completed in the last couple of months, and that's going to allow those trains to come across from the CSX to the FEC. Um, the next piece of that service would be extending north up to Jupiter. Palm Beach Gardens has the highest ridership station of the stations that are being looked at in the Jupiter extension. So without a Palm Beach Gardens station, there's not enough ridership to justify an extension of tri-rail service. But with a Palm Beach Gardens station, it opens up different opportunities that otherwise wouldn't exist. Other segments of service are broken down from about West Palm Beach um, into probably uh, downtown Fort Lauderdale, and then from downtown Fort Lauderdale down into Midtown. So ultimately, the entire corridor could be constructed uh, for additional tri-rail service as well as Brightline. Now, uh, as Natalie mentioned, um, we had our public workshop with the city about a year ago, um, and we have had, I think this is probably my 12th presentation, um, either in this chambers or in other locations in the city. So we've had a lot of public input um, and feedback, which is very helpful when you're a planning council because that's, that's how the best plans occur, when they have the most public input um, and the most feedback and, and chance to refine as we go. Um, and so in those workshops that began, again, a year ago, the kinds of things we heard are summarized on this slide. So what we heard from residents and business owners and property owners um, is that um, the city... The city uh, needs to be connected to the region. We have a lot of gated communities. We want transportation options that help penetrate the gate. We talked a lot about the aging community that Palm Beach Gardens has. Um, and Tom and Tom will talk about the demographics that really illustrate that. Um, but the concept of allowing people to age in place so they don't have to necessarily move, but they have the goods and services they need to age in place and enjoy the community they moved into, maybe raise their kids, but now they're empty nesters. Um, people wanted um, more sidewalks and pathways to utilize the parkway system, um, public uh, gathering areas like the ones the city has done such a nice job in creating around the community. Um, also, there was a, a lot of conversation about the employment base in the city of Palm Beach Gardens, the importance of having the, arranger, the array of goods and services that you have on PGA Boulevard. I think it's 90 or 99 restaurants on the PGA corridor alone. Um, that's a quality of life. Um, uh, benefit that you have. If you live in the city of Palm Beach Gardens, you have access to this really wide array of goods and services fairly close by. Well, to keep those things alive, transportation has a direct relationship with their long-term viability and sustainability. Um, folks talked about essential services housing. That's a term that was kicked around in the workshops, which really um, relates to police officers, firefighters, medical employees, teachers. Can they live in the city or does everyone have to drive in? Um, whether or not we have housing in town, to accommodate employees has a direct relationship to how much traffic we have. We heard from folks a lot about traffic and concerns about traffic, and what we know is infill housing in the manner that's illustrated in the slides that you'll see in a moment are really one of the strategies to actually mitigate traffic and reduce commuter traffic. Um, it's actually an economic development tool and a quality of life solution when you have um, an inbound traffic condition like Palm Beach Gardens has. What we know is that mobility in the new millennium, if you will, mobility going forward, looks different than it has in the past. Um, and the city has, um, uh, the city's development process has really focused historically a lot on the idea that pretty much every individual would drive their own car for every purpose, for every trip purpose. Um, and so we have a land use pattern that's really catering to that mode of mobility, if you will. Um, what we know 
is that the modes of mobility are really changing and they're changing pretty rapidly. So as we go forward, we see more Uber and Lyft taking place. We already know, for example, at downtown in the gardens, they subsidize your Uber trip if you're going to dinner in downtown at the gardens. That's part of their program now because they want folks to be able to get in. Um, we know that autonomous vehicles are on the horizon. Um, there are things like bike share and scooter share that are starting to crop up um, in communities across the U.S. and, and uh, in many of them in Palm Beach County. Um, and transit is part of that solution as well. And so as we anticipate what those trends are going forward, we want to make sure that we have the land use patterns in place for the city to be the most successful it can and maintain the high quality of life that it's known for. When we talk about TOD or transit oriented development, what we mean, again, I, I referenced that quarter to half mile catchment, if you will, around train stations and around transit nodes. That tends to be the walkable shed. It's the last mile for folks. And so when they come in on the bus or train or they leave on the trolley or whatever that mode is, having a walkable condition for them makes the trip more enjoyable. It actually creates people who want to ride and don't just have to ride, but it actually is a desirable choice. Um, uh, and also it allows us to capitalize on the investment that's represented by having a train station, for example, in the city of Palm Beach Gardens. We know that more successful TOD has higher densities and intensities than the uses that surround it. Where that's really beneficial for the city is it helps mitigate the traffic concerns that are raised also. So not only does it make the train service more successful, it makes your transportation network more efficient. It seems counterintuitive, but the science actually tells us that when you house the people that work in a district and you have those opportunities, they actually prefer to live in the district so they don't have to make a 45 or 60 minute commute in and out every day. And it frees up uh, space on the roadway network. There's a difference between transit-oriented development, or TOD, and what I call his evil twin TAD, or transit-adjacent development. So just because there's a lot of stuff that gets built around a train station, that has nothing to do with the successful ridership that you get from the station or the, your ability to capitalize on it. So things like big surface parking lots and suburban office campuses and mini storage, those are uses that really break down the district. And so you actually prevent folks from walking to the next use because it's not really comfortable for them to walk past a big field of parking or a use that's not occupied and doesn't have any permeability. Um, and so we're very careful when we look at train station locations to make sure we understand what the uses are in the district and how to accommodate them so one use connects to the next and connects to the next. So there's a difference between just development and then development that actually happens for a purpose. In this case, we're looking at a transit-oriented pattern that, again, is really going to focus on walkability um, and active, uh, active uh, spaces downstairs, especially. Um, in Palm Beach Gardens, the central business district is larger than the TOD study area that we're focusing on. But just to give you an idea of when we look at the central business district as a regional planning council, what we find is a map that kind of looks like this one. So it's the PGA corridor as the spine, but it extends pretty far north and south. And when we add up the number of businesses that you have in the district and the number of jobs, these circles actually are identifying all the different employers that exist in the city. This is 2014 data from InfoUSA, which is a national database that collects specifically this type of information. Um, and so that what we find is there are about 23,000 jobs in the city of Palm Beach Gardens in its central business district. And so we don't have a roadway network that can easily accommodate lots of growth without other things happening. For example, introducing the housing that a lot of these folks represent. The numbers are inbound commuting and Tom and Tom have more detail about those. Between 80, 90, perhaps 95%, depending on when you take the survey to understand how many folks are driving into work. If all of those folks are driving into work and you want to shop or eat, it's much harder for you to find a space on the network because those employees are filling the roadway network. When we start to balance land uses, there actually creates more space on the existing roadway network you don't have to expand it to have a better economic condition. So with that, Tom Lavash. Thank you, Kim. Uh, again, I'm a Tom Lavash. Um, one of the two Toms, uh, Kim calls us T-squared. And um, we, you know, they call economics the dismal science. And we'll endeavor not to make your eyes glaze tonight. Um, and we have a lot of information to share. Um, on demographics, on real estate market conditions, and what it all means as, as we move forward. And if you want to take a nap, we have a 141-page uh, market study that uh, is on the city's website. So why a market study? Uh, clearly, it, it, it is the underpinnings of uh, public policy, and it's to understand demographic conditions and real estate market trends and 
uh, translating growth forecasts, uh, how many new households or population growth or job growth. Job growth is a, a critical barometer to, uh, of demand for what we call workplace real estate, office buildings, retail centers, industrial parks. Uh, it's putting all of that into the crystal ball and, and understanding we have uh, TOD experience in eight states, understanding what might be feasible, what might be possible, um, and, and really importantly, ensuring that those, uh, the planning concepts that the planners and designers have, uh, have drawn are grounded in, in market and economic realities, and it's ultimately, of course, to inform uh, public policy as we move forward. Uh, just sort of scratching the surface in terms of, of uh, uh, demographics, it's what we call drivers of demand. Uh, for example, your uh, amazing sports activities have impact and demand on hotel rooms, uh, population growth, household growth, employment growth, et cetera. So over the course of, uh, of the past 17 years or so, the city grew by about 19,000 people and 10,000 households. That's a sustained annual pace of about 600 households, uh, or we're gonna equate one household to a housing unit, about 600 housing units a year, every year sustained. Um, and you're seeing that west, of course, and, and with that, you're, you're um, one of the fastest growing uh, communities in the county. Um, Jupiter and Boca and, and the city of West Palm Beach are, are your counterpart, counterparts in terms of, of uh, quickly growing communities. What's notable in looking ahead over the course of the next five years or so is that the two fastest growing co cohorts, age cohorts or age groups, are ages 65 and above, basically, and 74 uh, and then 75 and above. And the numbers suggest that, that uh, the number of people in those cohorts will grow by about 2,700 uh, people in Palm Beach Gardens. That has implications on the types of housing uh, that will be supportable over the next uh, five years. And Kim referenced this aging in place concept. And if you think about uh, as, an, as an aging household wanting to sell the big house in the gated community and want to stay in Palm Beach Gardens, where would you go? And so that has implications on, on directing that growth, uh, obviously, in locations that will help support uh, that product. Median age is increasing. You can see the numbers there. Um, over the course of the next five years, the, the crystal ball suggests about 2,000 new households or housing units. And part of our job as your real estate market analyst is to look at both short-term and long-term. And from a, a market perspective, we are most comfortable with looking at no more than 10 years. And, and so we have to balance this issue of, of short term, probably most realistic, with longer term, uh, 15, 20 years out. Some extraordinary numbers in terms of your economy, um, clearly affluent, high income households, not a surprise to anybody. You spend a lot on retail and we'll have some, some numbers to share with that. You have an inflow every year of $475, uh, $470 million on retail spending. That's basically enough to support a regional mall just about the size of uh, the Gardens Mall or about three and a half downtown at the Gardens. Every year there's inflow from outside the city into the city. That's an extraordinary number and you're very fortunate to, uh, to have that. Citywide, more current data than, uh, than the Info USA, there are about 39,000 jobs in 3,100 businesses. This is uh, Dun & Bradstreet data, so a very reliable source. The, the, the message here is that, that the city represents about 6% of the county in terms of, of uh, employment. That's what we call fair share, and we're gonna come back to that. You also have a really uh, strong jobs to population ratio. You basically have three quarters of a job for every resident of Palm Beach Gardens, uh, more than obviously the county as a whole. Uh, forgive us for the detail on this table. Uh, this basically says, this is US Census data that suggests that over a 10 year window between 2006 and 2015, the number of folks 29 and younger working in the gardens declined, both citywide and within the core area. And that may be a function of any number of things, one of which is the recession. In the, during the recession between 2007 and 2010, the city lost over 4,000 jobs. That's an extraordinary number. You've gained some of that back. Um, 
but one of the things to probe here is you begin to think about TOD's goal of creating walkable places and, and, and a little bit more urban is because that's where the millennials want to be. And so how much of this uh, decline in, in younger folks working is a function of either the recession or the fact that they now want to work in Delray Beach on Atlantic Avenue, uh, for example, or downtown West Palm um, it is something to consider when you think about public policies and, and think about uh, Palm Beach Gardens is competing against every other jurisdiction in, in not only in the county, not only in South Florida, but nationally. Those are critical issues from an economic development perspective. Just a couple of factoids, if, if we could, on your housing market. Uh, really strong housing market, high priced, not a surprise to anybody. Um, the multifamily rental market is very strong. Um, the, the industry, the real estate industry, considers 5% vacancy as what we call stabilized. That's a, 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 an industry standard accepted level of vacancy. Uh, you've been at 5% since 2010. You've clearly recovered from the recession. That's also a very strong point in your favor. Uh, over the next five years, the forecast suggests that your average housing price will increase to over half a million dollars. That's a significant issue of, uh, in terms of addressing the importance, as, as Kim noted, of essential services housing. Where can the policeman live? Where can the fireman live? How can you reduce the number of, of, of city employees who have to live in St. Lucie County because they can't afford to live in, in uh, Palm Beach Gardens, critical issue. Uh, also, I think telling is you had significant growth like much of South Florida during the early 2000s, really declined as you can see here um, in terms of annual housing starts during the recession and you've bounced back but not quite at the pace that you were during the early 2000s. Factoids in terms of office. Uh, there is a citywide inventory of about two and a half million square feet or about 10 or 11% of the county. Vacancies uh, have come down since the recession. That's a very positive thing. You're about, what, 10% if I read that correctly. Uh, so not quite stabilized, but uh, headed in the right direction. Uh, we have a metric in, in the real estate world called absorption, net absorption. It basically means leasing activity. If you're an office tenant, and you renew your lease but you didn't expand the amount of space you occupy, that's not in that number. But if you renewed your lease and leased more space, that difference, that delta is what's called net absorption. And that's basically been about 76,000 square feet a year um, over the past five years. Now I would note that that includes both North Palm Beach and Lake Park, but the number of office buildings in both of those jurisdictions is, is really small. Um, and what that would suggest is that it would take about four years for you to lease citywide the amount of vacant office space you have um, uh, in the city today. Um, we did a really detailed survey of the, what we're calling the core area, and in this case that was about a two mile radius, so it was most of that uh, geography that you saw. Uh, vacancies likewise have come down, but that's an, uh, the, the buildings in, in that part of the, uh, of the city are older. It's what the industry calls B and C buildings. They're not, a, not, not all A buildings. However, the, the red flag to us is that of those 26 buildings, absorption was only about 14,000 square feet a year. So wearing our banker's hat as your market analyst, that's not financeable in terms of new construction. Uh, what's gonna be telling uh, in that is how quickly the DeVostis buildings lease up um, uh, they, they obviously got uh, financing, but is it, you know, in our, in our observation, it may be a function of, of musical chairs, of tenants moving from one building to another building, particularly if they can get a good lease rate because DeVostis wants to lease up their, uh, their, new, their new property, their new uh, buildings. And I think another uh, telling factoid is that while you're about 40% of the citywide office inventory, you've got more than half the vacancy. And I think it speaks to uh, what happens to the B and C buildings long term um, in the core area. You've also entitled a lot of new development, particularly west with over two million uh, at Avenir, uh, half a million at Alton. There are six office buildings that uh, have been approved, have been entitled in the core area, uh, including obviously DeVostis, uh, the P uh, PGA station uh, has, has some more. 
And one of the things that we would want to understand as part of a, a market analysis is how much of the, how strong is the pre-leasing? In order to get financing, uh, DeVostis should have a, a, a certain number of, of uh, that certain percentage of those buildings pre-leased. So that's going to be a critical metric uh, over the next couple of years in terms of understanding the strength of the office market moving forward is how quickly does DeVostis lease up to get to 90, 95 percent occupancy. Um, also, the, the FPL, the 250,000 square foot building that they've announced uh, uh, to Cat 5 standard, about 1,000 employees, that's also critical. They have 80 acres on that site for available for future development. So how much impact will that have um, in the core area and on TOD opportunities moving forward? With that, I'd like to have my colleague Tom uh, speak about the hotel market. Thanks, Tom. Um, hotels are part of your economic base as well, <clears throat> both for business travel and for leisure travel. Um, there are about 17,000 hotel rooms in all of Palm Beach County. You have in nine properties about nine, almost 10 percent of that total. So you have, a, uh, and they range across uh, a number of industry categories from limited service up to upper upscale. So you've got a nice mix of room types and price levels. So everybody can usually find a place to stay here unless you're sold out because of a sports event or something else that we're interested in. Um, there's an additional area that Tom talked about for office. We looked at a slightly larger area as well that looked at uh, hotel rooms in North Palm Beach, Jupiter and Juno Beach. That added about 600 additional rooms. So in your competitive set where we're looking at this, there's about 2,200 rooms in that defined area. Um, STR, Smith Travel Research formerly, uh, is the industry standard for hotel uh, monitoring. Uh, and they track a number of things. The hotels report this. They're aggregated so you don't get any private business. But there are four key factors. Average annual occupancy, and that's ten you tend to look not at one year, but at a series of years to see if it's a trend or there's one year that's out of sync. This is a trend line where you say, well, what is it over a time period, and is it relatively stable? The second is average daily room rates, or ADRs. The third is revenue per available room, or REVPAR, sorry for the industry jargon. Uh, and then in addition to those three elements, you also look at what's the competitive context like. Is there a lot of growth happening in other places? So when we worked in Hollywood, they said, well, why would we care what's happening with an expansion of the Hard Rock Casino? Uh, that's, that's 800 rooms, but it's way over there. Well, it's important because in the regional sense, that room supply affects what you can do and the stability of your hotel market as well. What's going on in the area outside your primary competitive set? So in order to finance new hotels, the capital markets look at underwriting criteria that say if we look at those first three elements and the competitive set, what's going on? And they typically look at sustained, that's that five to six year period, sustained annual occupancies of between 65 and 72% you are performing well above that. So your hotel performance is really good. Uh, and your ADRs not only have been stable, they've been increasing. So sustained high levels of occupancy and increasing average daily rates, two very positive signs. Um, your uh, average hotel occupancy has ranged from about 73% to 77%, which is a really strong number. And in the in, in industry, they would say, well, then there's room in that market for more hotel capacity. Depending on the kind of hotel it is, uh, the size of the hotel, the number of rooms, that's probably two to four additional hotels somewhere. So in addition to this, we looked at what's in the pipeline that we'll talk about in a minute. The retail market, as Tom said, is, is very, very successful, drawing $470 million a year in inflow from outside the city. Uh, you have about 2.3 million feet uh, in just the core area. Uh, with a million four at the gardens, 340,000 at downtown at the garden, and the prospect for more. Uh, Legacy Place is a half a million, uh, and Palm Beach Garden Center, the old Lomans Plaza, is about 45,000 feet. That's a really strong concentration of retail. Uh, however, we also note that the retail industry is undergoing major change in the United States. We're oversupplied. Uh, we have about 26 square feet per capita in the country. That compares to Europe, for example, it's a multiple of 10. 2.6 square feet per person in Europe on average. A little higher in the UK, a little lower in other countries, but it's a lot different. So we have a lot, a lot, a lot of retail in this country. Uh, and a large part of our GDP has been based on consumer spending. We think that's changing. Uh, and it's changing in part because of suburban planning models 
of which you are an example. You have in those four malls the enclosed mall, the traditional enclosed mall, which is an evolving model with the gardens. You have the outdoor uh, lifestyle center with downtown. Uh, you've got a big box center and other supporting retail at Legacy Place, and you've got the traditional strip mall at the Old Omens Plaza. So you've got, like with hotels, a cross-section of retail types, but all four of those types are evolving pretty rapidly. In response, in part, to the aging of boomers who are buying more selectively uh, and are not in household formation, and the emerging millennial market that's equally large, 700 million millennials in the country, that's why it's important to adjust to their market preferences, which tend to be more outdoor oriented, more walkable, less interested in the traditional shopping mall. So the smart malls, the successful ones, like the gardens, are making moves to evolve and grow into different kinds of models beyond that, just that traditional one. It's a sort of both and solution. 70 million. 70, yeah, you 70. said 700 million. Oh, sorry, 70 million. Thank you. 70 million millennials, 700 million, we couldn't handle it. 70 million millennials. Uh, that will replace as the spending market the aging boomer market. There will be a transition, but their shopping tastes and preferences are very different. So evolution is going to be an important part of responding to that market preference and being available to them in ways that they like to shop. Um, the other question is the difference between online shopping, which a lot of people talk about as killing the retail industry. Uh, the retail industry is not dead. Uh, it's projected that by 2020, all of the online sales, even with exponential growth every year by Amazon and others, uh, is still only going to be 20% of total retail sales, including groceries. That doesn't include automobile sales. So when you read in the press uh, that the Internet has killed the shopping center and the, re the downtown area, that's not exactly true. Changing it, absolutely. Having a big effect, it's not negligible. And as somebody recently pointed out to me, that 20% difference is where a lot of the profit margin was for those stores. So it's not a negligible amount, but the retail store, the physical store, is in fact far from dead. And the strength you have in that, we think, is a strong basis for further evolution. I wanted to mention a couple of case studies of examples of things that we think are effective uh, bases for recommendations here. Tyson's Corner Center is a 2.4 million square foot traditional enclosed shopping center. You see it in the upper left up there, spreading around in suburban Virginia. Uh, in the middle of a very sprawling part of, of uh, Fairfax County. Uh, very successful mall, like the gardens, high performance and sales productivity. But the metro, Washington's metro, uh, regional transit system, which is heavy rail, uh, shown on the lower left, decided they decided to run a line out to Dulles Airport, and it runs right through Tyson's Corner. Uh, Fairfax County uh, decided to replan the whole area, which was pretty typical office parks, very much actually like you, with traditional office parks and, and low scale uh, and very strong retail components in it. Uh, they decided to replan the whole thing. They revised the comp plan. They're doing uh, transit-oriented development with the highest density at the four station locations and then tapering down, redeveloping a lot of old class B and C office buildings into higher density walkable environments with a street grid and to bring people back to the formula. So you see here examples of some of the kinds of housing that are significantly more dense than were there before, but not high rise, not high density in the sense of we're going to turn ourselves into New York City. The, the physical realm that the county is focused on is how do we better connect all these what formerly were separated, much the way we've talked about it here, with street grids, with walkable environments, with open green space and the like, and to put people back where it's not just shopping, it's really a community gathering place with all that means. Uh, the second case study is an example from Columbia, Maryland. Columbia was one of the first major planned cities in the country 50 years ago. It's largely built out. It's about 100,000 people. Uh, and it was centered uh, by a, a, an original Rouse Company mall called the Mall at Columbia. That mall is now owned by successor companies <coughs> uh, and managed, pardon me, uh, and all the area around it, which was suburban office parks, sur surface parking lots, or undeveloped land, uh, the owner of all that, the Howard Hughes Corporation, uh, has come in and they are jointly working together to recast the mall in new formats where it's not just enclosed, it has a new restaurant cluster and other things, but also to create real neighborhoods that are walkable. You can see that same pattern of densification with higher density office and about 2,000 residential units uh, where they're recasting what was a conventional suburban mall 
in a surface a sea of surface parking into a real walkable core area. The mall remains, but they're adding a lot more residence, office, new hotels, and additional retail. So this idea of taking this traditional mall model and evolving it into a more urban context, a more walkable context, a more pedestrian friendly context is also adding a lot of value to the property. It's a lot more profitable to put some limited scale development on surface parking lots than it is to keep it as a surface parking lot. The last element of something we think would be a great addition to this market uh, is an idea of an independent art house cinema. There are a number of these that are emerging around the country and great operators, including some very close to you. Uh, but these are not the conventional large release, wide release movie complex like the one at downtown. This is a smaller theater complex, three to five theaters, 50, 60, 70 seats per theater. Um, they're running limited run films, art house films, independent films, and foreign films that have a smaller niche market, but it's a higher spending market. They often have restaurants and bars associated with them, great seating, um, but it's a whole different kind of movie experience. And it gets the films out there for, for sophisticated markets that don't play in the major movie theaters. The AMCs and the others just don't carry these films because it's not the same kind of market. You can't fill a 500 seat theater for it, but you can fill a 50 or 70 seat theater multiple nights and people spend extra. That's where the profit is anyway on the food side. So those are things that we think would complement your already extraordinarily strong retail market and allow it to evolve in ways that will make more money uh, for the city, that will make more money for the property owners, and that will build on your tax base. Any questions? So, um, so Brightline's maximum uh, maximum service will be 32 trains per day, uh, which is 16 in each direction. Uh, what TriRail is discussing is running uh, maybe hourly train service. Um, that would be um, uh, that would be 24 additional trains. Right? Brightline is going to be double tracking the entire corridor from where it ends now in uh, at 15th Street in West Palm, um, all the way up to Coco. Um, and run um, then west from there along State Road 528 into Orlando International Airport. Um, as part of that infrastructure that, um, that really it's FEC slash Brightline is going to install, uh, they're also going to be funding the, the infrastructure necessary for quiet zones to be installed along the corridor. Um, so each of the intersections will be rebuilt at a higher standard, if you will, to allow the local governments who want to to establish quiet zones. The council actually worked with the seven local governments between West Palm and Boca to establish quiet zones which are now in place today. Um, and so that quiet zone program is expected to be extended north from the northern part of West Palm Beach, if you will, from 15th Street um, all the way up to Tequesta and then Martin St. Lucie and Indian River discussing that as well. Um, Brightline also is putting in a number of sightings to allow trains to um, be programmed more efficiently, if you will. So faster trains can go around slower trains and continue on the corridor. What's beneficial about that is if the gate's going to close, the gate closes once for both trains to go through and open again. Um, the, other I the other improvement that um, is happening along with that infrastructure is the installation of what's called positive train control. So positive train con control is also referred to as PTC. I mean, everything that we work on has an acronym, so apologies for that. But what PTC does um, is allow for a quarter to become a smart quarter, if you will. This is federal legislation that was established um, after um, an unfortunate accident in California that requires all quarters that have a mix of passenger and freight service um, to have centralized dispatch so that the location of the trains, the speed of every train, and the location of every gate and switch is known along the corridor. Um, that actually allows for a much safer operation, a faster and more efficient operation. So again, when the gate goes down one time, there's the ability to go, have two trains go through at once and the gate comes up afterwards. Um, so that's, uh, that's an overview with respect to freight, um, which is the other user on the corridor. Um, at the height of the economy, uh, FEC was running 20, uh, 26 to 28 daily freight trains. Uh, it fell to, 14, that was in 2006. 
Uh, by 2009, they were down to 14 daily trains. Um, the forecast that FEC has um, is to get back up to 20 ultimately. Um, those 20 trains though would be run and programmed in conjunction with the Brightline trains. Again, with a goal that uh, when gates close, they close once for both trains to go through um, and then open again. Um, the other difference that's happening is as Brightline is double tracking the corridor, um, it's replacing it with quieter track that's actually welded track. Um, the track that's out there today is not a consistently welded track, so you can hear a clickety clack when the train goes by. The new track that's being put in is called class six track, I believe, if I remember the numbers from, uh, from the documents that we've been asked to review. So the class six track is a faster track, it's a quieter track, you don't have the clickety clack when the train goes by, but the track's actually physically seamed together. So the trains can run more quietly, they can run faster, which is better to clear the intersections more quickly, um, and it's more efficient. Um, adding the PTC or the positive train control to it uh, makes the whole system much more efficient and it all crea also creates real-time interface um, with um, all of the other transportation agencies um, so, that, um, uh, so that where the trains are and you know, when that infrastructure is going to be activated is known so from a dispatch standpoint. Okay, I'm sorry. I was supposed to. Uh, I was supposed to repeat the question. So my apologies to the public if they're listening. Uh, my job was to get the microphone into the hands for questions. I'm just curious on the flyover that goes from PGA to I-95 South uh -huh. between four and say 6:30. It's backed up. Uh -huh. How do you see a train station at that location impacting that already congested uh, traffic flow? Right. There's not really a there's not really a conflict between those two activities. It's very different types of service, um, and so um, and so the onbound traffic. I think it's onbound traffic onto I-95 in the morning is what you're referring to, or, or onbound in the afternoon rather, afternoon. in the afternoon. Yeah. So so if anything, having a train makes it better because you don't have a need for as many people to get in their car and drive out. But instead, if they're working in the district, I mean, Tom's numbers are citywide, 39,000 jobs. I mean, what we're seeing in the core district is. Yeah, 24,000 jobs, 26,000 jobs. PM rush hour. So PM rush hour, yeah. So if you don't have to fight to get on the roadway network, but you can go to the train and leave by train, that's what folks tend to do, especially when they're regular employees. And that's what's really filling your roadway network. And your rush hour is regular employees that are coming in every morning and going out every afternoon. So what the train allows to happen is for that commuter population to use different choices. They don't have to drive. It's less expensive for many people to take the train instead. And so it facilitates that flow out. So that's one way to mitigate it, if you will, or reduce the impact of the PM rush hour. Um, the other thing that, and I haven't had a chance to t show any of the illustrations yet that kind of show how the, the district might, th how the city may want to encourage the district to infill, um, is that a lot of that rush hour traffic is folks that are leaving because there's nowhere for them to live. So they have to drive in and out because there's not housing stock to accommodate them. What we recommend in the long range plans for the city um, to help, again, reduce traffic on the roadway network, especially in the commuter hour, is add the residential units that are missing. So that actually is what regions that are successful do to balance out those flows. Um, and that way, you actually create the housing where folks who live in the district can live there if they work in the district and live there if they want to, and actually takes cars off the roadway network and contains them. Um, and so it becomes a much more efficient use of the transportation network. At least this is what we see when we look at regions across the United States. So those are all the lessons that we learn when we do that type of research. So, so that's what we think the city, um, the city gets lots of different benefits, not just from a train station coming in, but from the land use pattern that makes it more efficient. So, okay. What does it all mean? The city has approved, has entitled about 6,200 units. Lion's share, uh, of course, is, is West, uh, Avenir, Alton, uh, other projects. If the city continued to grow at the 600 units or households per year as it did between 2000 and 2017, it would only take about 10 years to fill up, to occupy, to build out uh, the 6,200 entitled units. However, the, the, the short-term forecast for the next five years suggests that that growth will moderate 400 units a year, which would suggest that that would take longer, uh, of course. and and. It, all bets if there's a, are off if there's a recession. And we think it's coming, um, right? <laughs> I think 
Uh, yeah. Uh, he thinks it's coming sooner than I think it's coming, but it's coming. And um, if we could answer when, you know, I wouldn't be here tonight. So um, but you begin to think about a 20-year window of long-term planning um, at even at 400 units a year, which is the more moderate forecast, it, that would be 8,000 units over the next 20 years. And in our experience nationally uh, with, with other TOD projects, we, we define what we call a capture rate. How realistic is it to uh, plan for and how much can TOD specific housing, uh, how much can we capture? And generally about a 20, 25% capture uh, is a realistic number to plan for, uh, which would su suggest somewhere about 2,000 units in that core area, which in other words says the other 75% could occur elsewhere in the city. So growth can continue out west. We're protecting the single family neighborhoods out west. This is focused on the core. And, and that may be uh, a, a 20, 25, 30 year build out depending on so many variables like interest rates, the strength of the economy, job growth, um, et cetera. Other factors, macroeconomic factors that are, are unknown at this point. So um, uh, key issues in terms of, of, uh, of the housing market. And the other thing too is that, uh, and we touched on it earlier in terms of the conversion of B and C office buildings. What happens to those buildings uh, over the long term and are there opportunities to, to backfill, if you will, and convert some of those buildings? Uh, in terms of office, likewise, the city has approved uh, a significant amount of office space, about 3.2 million square feet, uh, much of it, of course, west. And when we do an office analysis like this, what we, t what we do is, is we look at job growth in those sectors that are, uh, that are office employees. And uh, DEO at the state level in Tallahassee suggests that Palm Beach County will add 81,000 jobs over the next eight years. And DEO only forecasts in eight year uh, uh, windows. And if the city maintained its fair share, about 6%, uh, we had uh, touched on that earlier, uh, all, all things being equal, the city will maintain its fair share, which would suggest that about 4,600 jobs would be coming to Palm Beach Gardens over the next eight years. And that's, that's all jobs. It's office employees, it's retail, it's industrial. So what we do in, in an office analysis is then we, we estimate what those office using jobs are. And what that would suggest is that that would translate into demand for about 340, 350,000 square feet of space. But wearing our banker's hat and as, as in a, in a desire as your market analyst to be conservative, we're gonna say, you know what, you've got some existing vacant office space on the ground today. The banker's gonna say, I want some of that leased before I will finance new construction. And so what that does, we assumed about th a third of it uh, of the existing vacant space is leased, uh, which reduces what we call uh, net demand to basically a little bit more than the two DeVostis office buildings that are under construction today over the next eight years. So you could support two more of those buildings plus a little bit more citywide, uh, significantly less than what you've entitled, which, which reinforces the importance of uh, economic development strategies where you are, are focused on business, business retention and recruitment because you're competing against downtown West Palm, you're competing against Boca, uh, Jupiter, you know, and, and South Florida, and in fact, uh, you know, many, many jurisdictions, not only in Florida, but throughout the country. Yes, I, yes, there's a note here. Um, so the, the 4,600 jobs does, is, is natural market growth. It excludes FPL, what we call owner user building. So UTC, FPL are on top of that. And it, it suggests because of this issue of competition and as a desire to enhance your fair share that you ought to be recruiting more of those owner users important from an economic development perspective. On the hotel side? Yep. So we said the hotel market's strong here. Um, we looked at uh, from 2011 through the third quarter of 2017 when the study was being completed. Uh, your occupancy rates were high, as we said, 77.8% is like an invitation to come build more hotels. That's very, very strong. An increasing ADR, and increasing REPFAR all good and underwritable market signs for hotel development. 
However, we also note that you have other hotels in the pipeline that have been approved or pending. There's a little more than 900 rooms uh, that are planned or proposed with a 180 room hotel at downtown at the gardens. PGA station has 121 rooms and then 300 rooms each proposed for uh, Alton and Avenir. Uh, those are coming. Uh, they appear to be uh, pretty market supportable uh, and they're not all coming online at the same time. So if you should really want to fall asleep easily, take a look at the hotel table in the report. It projects out going forward 10 years uh, and indicates when those hotels, uh, to the extent we knew at the time, are coming online and how they dovetail together as responses to market growth. The other thing that I want to uh, emphasize here is we also have FP&L coming with a thousand people in this first building. Uh, we don't know yet uh, what that means in terms of business travel that might be associated with it. It might mean a lot, it might mean a little, but it's going to exist, it's going to be there. And we also know you've had a very strong strategic push into sports facilities and sports venues that are bringing tens of thousands of people to this area, to your community, on an annual basis and stretch over different sports seasons. However, because we're data nerds, we need hard numbers to be able to count those, and we don't have good hard data yet, but we think that's something that you might want to collect uh, uh, looking ahead to really understand it. Some of those may be drive-to markets that go back home at night after the tournament or the event or whatever it is. Others are hotel guests, and we don't know how many of those are yet. Those are on top of the growth that you're already likely to get and can support. So it, it constitutes a very measurable, uh, and reasonable growth pattern of hotels you already have in the pipeline and potentially even greater uh, growth after that. So what have we learned about all this? Well, we know that transit does add value. Uh, in the market, I live in, in a transit corridor in Virginia, just outside Washington. Uh, the brokers, the real estate brokers in my neighborhood tell me that if you're within a quarter mile, doesn't matter how old the house is or how new, or what terrible shape it's in, you get 15% market value increase just because of walkability. And that pattern has been repeated in different cities around the country. So it's not a fluke. People who are interested in transit will pay more to be proximate to it because it gets them out of their car. So that's something that we know is the truth. Uh, we also know that those benefits don't happen over time. I've lived in uh, these neighborhoods for about 30 years. Uh, and I was on the original Neighborhood Planning Council looking at the subway coming in, and we planned uh, very effectively and politically strategically to pile up the density in the two blocks on either side of the rail corridor. Then it tapers down to the single-family neighborhoods. That has proven to be a both-and solution for us because the folks who want easy access to multifamily housing live in the higher-density housing right on top of the subway corridor. But then the neighborhoods were protected, and in fact, Arlington County which is a pretty prudent county about the way they plan things, have witnessed enough property tax revenue growth because of the limited density that my home values have gone up, but my property taxes have remained stable. So they've effectively captured back in a confined area and protected the rest of us from overpaying because of it. Density doesn't always mean height. If you think about a city like Paris or Washington, D.C., where there are height limits, you can get a lot of office and residential development within a, ho a low height level. And you can see at Tyson's Corner, they're not building skyscrapers everywhere. It's a mix. And a lot of those are moderate density, five and six floor, which is, you'll see in a minute, is the notion for here. We think that's a very acceptable scale to be incorporated. Change can, in fact, mean better. And one of the things we heard earlier was we had some people who said, we don't want anything to change in Palm Beach Gardens. Don't change anything. Well. It's very hard to prevent anything from changing. It's inevitable. Managing change and being smart about it is a way you can make a better community and still keep the things you love about this place and the scale that it has today. Uh, if you add the right kind of housing in the right location, that will actually, it sounds counterintuitive, but it reduces traffic. Fewer people have to get in their car and drive a long way to get here, and that probably means being able to provide, as you heard, for some of those essential services, for your policemen, for your school teachers, for your librarians, uh, for people who don't have high paying jobs but provide those critical services that you need as residents. That will reduce traffic volume if you have that housing and if it's managed and densified in a way that benefits from access to transit. 
Uh, and then finally, protecting the taxpayer base with incremental growth, with steady growth in small chunks that are manageable and can happen appropriately over time as the market catches up, that protects the existing taxpayer base. You can have both solutions. Okay. Questions for Tom and Tom, who are not going anywhere, but I'm gonna, I now get the, uh, uh, the, the, the wonderful luxury of taking you on a tour of the plan. So many of you have seen some of these slides. Again, I think this is probably my 12th presentation um, in Palm Beach Gardens um, on the plan. Um, and um, this presentation is available on the city's website and it's fully illustrated in the report. Um, and so uh, what we describe this as kind of a, an opportunity tour. Um, and, and as Tom and Tom mentioned, this is a long-term infill redevelopment strategy for the city. So this is 25 to 30 years of infill that's represented in the illustrations. Um, and so um, they're powerful images and they represent a lot of opportunity because that market is there for the city. So I use that as kind of some opening um, considerations for you, if you will. Um, and so when we think about the PGA station property, this is located um, the closest to the station. Obviously, there's the station arriving, theoretically. And by the way, this is one of a hundred different ways we can illustrate the program uh, for the city's consideration. How the architecture is applied is going to ultimately be a city conversation with the developers, the investors, and the community. Uh, this is just one way of illustrating it, but, um, but there's lots of other ways to illustrate it, just to give you, just to give you an idea. So there's the train. Of course, it's arriving on time, right, at the station, uh, just as we were waiting for it. Um, and on the PGA station site, um, what we would suggest, and the code already permits, buildings being infilled along really, for the most part, are a lot of drive aisles and helping those drive aisles become a series of streets and blocks. Streets and blocks are walkable. Large parking expanses are not comfortable for pedestrians. Streets and blocks, though, uh, where you locate buildings in an urban form and you get them against the street, the street becomes more comfortable. People want to walk on it. So, for example, maybe um, a residential use locating near the station makes a whole lot of sense. The hotel is already going uh, under construction, actually. This is a hotel that's already permitted in that site. It makes a lot of sense and starts to set up, I think this is called Design Center Drive. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Design Center Drive running east-west uh, towards Lomans Plaza, which is along the western edge of the, um, kind of over this little section of the district, if you will, with uh, I-95 in, the, in the, the rear of the image um, and PGA corridor to, the, uh, to what is my right, so it must be your left. So, and then as that site continues to infill over time, this is a location that is really so isolated from single family residential in the city, but it allows a place for housing to happen and housing we think is a really important driver for the city's economy. Whether or not the station arrives in year one or year 10 or year 20, this housing is the housing that makes the city more economically viable because it makes better use of your transportation infrastructure. So again, over time, as additional buildings infill in the district, this program is a four to six story program for the most part. The hotel in the back is a little taller. I'll get to that in a moment. But for the most part, these are four to six story buildings that are just located in a more urban fashion. Um, and again, providing the type of infill uses that the city really needs and the market is looking for. Um, so what happens at PGA Station? It introduces a hotel that we know is under construction, residential and other uses to this very visible location. When you come in on the PGA Boulevard, the two sites you see first are really Lomans Plaza and this location, which is PGA Station. Um, it tries to maximize the benefit of the station to the city, and it really enhances what happens on FPNL. Now, we didn't illustrate what would theoretically happen on FPNL because we knew FPNL was doing that anyway. In fact, the newspaper just ran the other day um, the building that FPL is considering, which would kind of land about where my mouse is circling on the map. So that'd be a set of residential and hotel uses primarily that would really complement what happens on FPNL site and what happens on the remnants of FPNL site, which is, um, you know, of the 80 acres, FPNL is only looking to develop 250,000 feet of what um, then remains another 25 acres, I think, of 20 to 25 acres of developable, um, developable area. Shifting a little further to the west, the old Lomans Plaza, um, as uh, Tom Moriarty mentioned, this is kind of the strip center format of retail, which is no longer a marketable format. There's lots of reasons this site's been vacant for a long time. Um, and one of the things that we would suggest is so important to the city, this is the signature location in northern Palm Beach County um, that has opportunity for hotel or really significant infrastructure. It is visible for all of I-95. It is on PGA Boulevard, which connects to the Turnpike. 
and it's really a gateway entry to the city. Um, and so what we suggest in this location, when there's market for that next significant hotel to come in, this is a six to eight story program. Uh, what's next to it is already 10 stories. I think it's 11 stories actually, uh, the Marriott. Um, so this is six to eight stories of habitable space. The architecture could really be significant in this location and why shouldn't it be um, at this gateway entry to the city? Um, it's designed to really capitalize on that view coming from the train station. So if you can imagine Design Center Drive, when you come off the train station, this building is designed to terminate the vista. It's kind of a classic planning technique um, to really celebrate the relationship between the train station at one end and this very significant use at the other. Um, as the site continues to infill over time, there's opportunity for additional either residential, residential limited stay. These could be other hospitality type uses. The hospitality market is changing so much and folks now wanna often stay in something that feels more like an apartment. So these buildings could have any combination of those types of uses. They could be residential that are related to FPNL, which is to the north, the biotech center, right? Three million square feet of biotech to the south and the hospital nearby as well. Um, and so again, continuing an infill pattern on the site um, with the hotel being the largest structure and the balance of the site for the most part being kind of a four to six story program. Again, one way to illustrate how the city may want to incentivize this district in a manner that creates the uses that we need, that the market wants to support, that again, add to the infill composition of the city to make it more economically sustainable and viable over time. <laughs> Moving over to the east end of the Gardens Mall. Now one of the things when we look at a mall like this one is what's the most significant visible component of the mall when you look at it from space is the 7,000 parking spaces that surround the mall. That is a really big heat sink when it comes to uses on the ground, right? Um, because that parking isn't really generating any particular revenue. You know, the revenue is getting generated in here and this parking is really taking up space. It augments it, but it doesn't have to exist in this surface format. Um, and so when we look at a use like the Gardens Mall, one of the things we know is the perimeter road is really, really fast. So I grew up in Palm Beach Gardens, so I was in the mall when it first opened, in fact. Um, and, uh, and this is a fast roadway um, that has lots of other things happening on it today. So starting to calm down the roadways around the mall is one way to better connect it. There actually aren't sidewalks. You don't realize there aren't sidewalks until you try to walk there and realize you either have to walk in the road or you walk on the berm. That's the only way to get in and out. Um, and so adding sidewalks and bicycle facilities um, and starting to calm the traffic with interventions like roundabouts and boulevards are ways to begin to interconnect the mall in a more meaningful fashion, kind of in a more civilized way, if you will. One of the things we learned in doing interviews is the folks that work in these office buildings out here, they like to go to lunch in the mall and the mall's done a really nice job of expanding the range of restaurants, but it's so unfriendly they drive. It's 1,500 feet and they get in their car and they drive and they go all the way back out in the roadway network and they drive through the parking lot to go to lunch and then they drive back. That seems crazy, right? So if we can do things to improve the relationship between those two, we actually do a better job of keeping those dollars. Maybe we have a little less uh, carbon that's uh, heating up everything at the same time. Um, and so as we start to infill, this is 1,000 parking spaces in front of the Sears. And we know this isn't gonna be a Sears any longer, right? So, um, so that's opportunity. Um, so as we start to infill that site, um, there's opportunity to, uh, um, to infill residential buildings, for example, along the edge of that site, to add small retail uses, for example, to uh, better interconnect the office buildings to that edge, and then start to do things like locate an art cinema, maybe some additional residential that would be, surface, uh, that would be parked with a parking structure, um, and continue to add in the missing uses that really make this a very formal, pleasant interconnected condition, right? So instead of a thousand parking spaces, this could represent 500, maybe a thousand residential units um, over time. It could have uh, six to 10 theater um, uh, screens in an, an arts theater and maybe um, some additional food and beverage uses to make it a more active district. Um, it actually makes it a safer district too because now there are folks that are out um, in an active format in these spaces that are otherwise kind of dark at night otherwise. Um, and so again, this, is, uh, this happens to be about a 14 acre section of the 100 acre mall site. Um, this is programming about a thousand of the parking spaces into something that's a little different. And what we know in looking at national trends is this is how malls are more competitive going forward. So we wanna keep them all as an active, vibrant, good taxpayer in the city. It's the largest single owned parcel um, in the city of Palm Beach Gardens. So we want it to be as competitive as we can um, for it to be successful, not just for the city, but also for the TOD district as well. 
when we talk about connectivity, one of the things we know <coughs> is that just looking at the mall in particular, the mall has the mix of uses that mixed use calls for. They're just very well separated from one another with berms and with um, parking areas and roadways. Um, and so, for example, if we zoom in and we look at the relationship between, for example, the mall where you can get a Starbucks or you can go shopping, right, and then you can walk back to the hotel or you can go to the condo, well, what happens is you have to make that journey in this kind of format. So you're walking through a parking lot and then climbing through a berm to get through the break in the hedge so you can get to the other side of your destination. Um, and why does that happen? Well, what we've done is we forgot to connect for pedestrians. So these are what we call goat trails often, which is people find a way to get through. And so also over time, you get a trail. And so when you have trails that look like this, you have people moving back and forth in this format. That's something that we want to improve. Um, and so instead, what we can do, for example, at the mall is start to introduce buildings in a format along drive aisles that start to formalize streets that create these civilized formal connections so that the many folks, especially millennials, they're getting dropped off at the mall and then they walk to downtown at the gardens, I'm raising two, and then they walk back to the mall to get picked up. Well, we don't want them doing in, that in the dark. We don't want them breaking them through the hedge <coughs> and we don't want them to try to cross the perimeter road that's moving too fast. So we start to break that environment down to actually give cars a more rational way to get through the intersection, making a left here. I don't know how many of you take deep breath when you make a left from Kyoto Gardens Drive. I do every time. Um, and so we can improve that with things like roundabouts. These green stripes are identifying uh, uh, bicycle facilities. The white ones are identifying pedestrian facilities. And again, we can formalize those connections and add the residential we're missing. This adds 50 to 100 um, residential units and they're all self-parked, by the way. Um, and so we can convert <coughs> underutilized space with the uses that are missing and at the same time do a little city building and create some urbanism to connect those uses um, that are disconnected otherwise. Other places we can do that around the mall, um, there are a few locations where roundabouts make some sense. Certainly doing um, everything we can to improve pedestrian and bicycle access improves the, kinetic, uh, the, competitive, uh, the competitiveness, sorry about that, of the mall and its connections from the uses that lie around it. So when we look west over at downtown at the gardens or, or the district um, and the uses that exist there, these are all buildings that are in a two to four story program. Um, the two office buildings that are under construction now are both illustrated as fully built. Um, and again, as we add buildings in an urban format, um, doing our best to uh, take underutilized par surface parking lots and create them into structures with use, we actually make each of these sites more competitive and we make the whole district more competitive um, from a city standpoint. And these buildings aren't going next to single family residential, right? One of the points that Tom and Tom uh, made is that by adding these infill uses, we're not, we're, not putting, um, we're not making transitions that don't make sense. These are two to four story buildings within their own district, um, but they're, um, they're saving taxpayer dollars in this format because they start to carry the tax burden that other taxpayers might have to to maintain higher levels of service. Um, Legacy Place, another very simple opportunity to introduce residential. Um, in this location, we have the residential component of the site physically separated from all the commercial activity that's taking place there. Um, and so as this site infills over time, there's the opportunity to add 150, maybe 200 residential units in a location that really takes dry vials and turns them into roadways. Again, you take a, a site that doesn't have a lot of structure to it and it turns, um, it, turns it into blocks from super blocks. Um, so in doing that infill um, in this location, you actually make the retail that's there more competitive because now there's more buyers that can conveniently access it. We're directly across the street from the train station in this location and you can actually maximize the benefit that comes from this really beautiful lake that right now just has retail that turns its back to it. Instead, you can actually front it with residential that would be ta able to take advantage of that amenity and again, make a contribution to the city. So there's a kind of a before picture, if you will, of legacy and there's an after. Um, of course, there was no train horn because there's a quiet zone there now uh, when the train comes into the station. Um, and that's an idea of, for example, the scale and the intensity of what makes sense in this location. Um, so with that, my contact information um, is here and available through the city. We will stay to answer questions. Hopefully there are some, but if not, uh, we thank you for the opportunity to present. Um, and uh, these are all policy opportunities for the city to, uh, to consider as it goes forward. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. Well, Kim, as you know, when you presented this to council, we all got a little nervous because of all of the infill. Please reiterate your estimation of time for doing all of this. Sure. 
Sure, this is a 25 to 30 year program. So, and every one of the images, every one of these sites that are illustrated are illustrated in a manner to show how they could phase over time. Um, so the city has an opportunity to begin with a small piece, like for example, maybe one of the blocks in Legacy Place, just as an example, that maybe is a good site for 50 or 100 units, and then over time, allow another phase to happen. Um, the biggest impact is the mall illustration that we showed, and, and that's another site, and what we see as an example in other malls, Boca Town Center is having the same process happen now, where one small piece of the site gets a, um, the introduction of, for example, residential, and then over time, as that, um, as that use becomes absorbed and the market presents itself, over time, there are opportunities for additional sites to, to be unlocked and developed, if you will. 25 to 30 years, at least, is what's represented in the imagery that we've um, put forward. Kim. Uh, yeah, I think you need the microphone. microphone. Kim, who's going to pay for this? So Tri-rail or, or the city? or And is Tri-rail, in your estimation, mm -hmm. economically viable 30 years out? So, okay, so let's, let me try to break down your question because there's a couple of answers to it. A couple of questions and a couple of answers. So one of the questions is who pays for the development pattern that's illustrated? That's private investment. So the, back up for a second. Everything but the station itself, right, is private is private capital. That's what we would we would anticipate. With respect to the station itself, <coughs> pardon me, um, the extension of Tri-Rail uh, has been envisioned um, as a project that gets funded in three parts. Okay, so 50% of the funding would come from the Fed, the federal government, from the Federal Transit Administration. That's the agency, the federal agency that's designed to uh, to fund service like this. 25% would come from the state. And the other 25% would come from some combination of local sources. That's how the funding would be established. Um, one of the things the city is considering in its mobility plan is the idea of adjusting impact fees. This is a conversation that's taking place countywide right now. Um, the, the, the city and the and other municipalities and the county as well um, have policy choices to make about whether or not impact fees should be used just for roadways and right now the way they're written is they're only available for new roadways that add new capacity, so none of the existing roadway network gets improved, really, with the existing impact fees. It's not designed for that. It's designed to build roads that are outside of that urban area. Um, so that's a policy question. Is that what's right for the city of Palm Beach Gardens and Palm Beach County? And if not, how might that be adjusted? Okay. Uh, the other opportunity the city has um, is whether or not it wants to establish a mechanism to capture new revenue that's created by the uses taking place particularly in this district and use some of that additional revenue specifically for the station costs. So these are policy opportunities the city has to, to work through. Um, so how does it get paid for? There's, there's 25 or 30 different mechanisms you can use um, to help finance the station. Ballpark it for me. How much? Uh, how much to run tri rail all to the build, way north? To build the station, extend. To, to Up to Jupiter? Yeah. Uh, the most current estimate, I, I mean, the most recent estimates had it between 75 and 100 million dollars total cost. 25% um, of that would be some combination of local sources. Um, the TPA, the Transportation Planning Agency that the mayor sits on, is working through different financing mechanisms. What most local governments are looking at are mechanisms to capture new tax revenue that's generated from new development that comes uh, around those stations and to utilize a portion of that to pay for their financial commitment. That's what most local governments are doing. I don't know, Mayor, if you wanted to add anything to that, but okay. Uh, thanks, Kim. Question and comment. Just remember, sure. this is just conceptual. There's no plans mm -hmm. at this time to convert our city to look like what, what we're seeing here today, but it is a, a viable option that we have to think about. Uh, the other thing that you didn't really touch on much was essential housing mm -hmm. and how that might impact or allow people that you know are in essential housing, uh, essential services uh, that would require you know affordable homes that are close to, to places of, of work. So if you mm -hmm. could touch on that too. Sure, absolutely. So one of the opportunities the city has as it f figures out what's right, right, and these are all policy conversations for the city to have going forward. Um, one, of the, one of the things we know in looking at the day, data is there aren't lots of places for folks who work in the city to live in the city. 
That's just what the that's just the math of our situation right now. Um, and so those are those are policy choices. What many cities do around the country um, is find ways to change a land use mix when they see that type of imbalance. And that's what the city has now is an imbalance. It's it's uh, uh, we have um, uh, we have mostly single family residential in the city. Uh, we have lots of jobs in the core part of the district. Um, and we know most folks drive in in their own car every day and drive out every afternoon because we have very few transportation choices in the city. Um, those are policy opportunities for the city to explore. Do you want to have more choices so folks can do, um, cause folks can travel in and out of the district um, in different modes? That's one policy opportunity. The other policy opportunity is you want to encourage more housing that's um, able to be afforded by folks that work in the district, that work in the city. Police officers, firefighters, medical district employees, nurses, physicians assistants, um, teachers, um, uh, public employees, um, folks that, um, that work in any of the businesses in the, down, in, um, in the core part of the city, those housing opportunities just aren't really present for the most part, so they're driving in every day. So the city has opportunities to encourage that by lots of different measures. Um, if this type of housing program, for example, this type of infill makes sense, from a look and feel standpoint, the city can, um, can make it easier for um, developers to build this type of housing. What we know, again, just from the math, is that adding units, adding residential units that are able to house employees that work in the district, they tend to be occupied by people who work in the district because they don't want to drive from Port St. Lucie into the city every day and back again. Um, so that's, a, uh, uh, that's an impact on, uh, on transportation infrastructure. Tom? From a if, I could, if I could chime in too. Um, before Tom, I'm sorry. Um, regarding the location of where it makes sense to provide essential services housing, and, and, and of course the city is taking a very good hard look at this right now, uh, and, and we are working with the chamber actively uh, on identifying this issue. Uh, essential services housing needs to be near transit. If you look at the federal income tax program that's available and essentially all the housing programs that require and list out specific criteria, the most important criteria that is listed at the top is are you close to transit? You can't look at housing in a vacuum and often that is lost in the conversation of, of housing and affordable housing and workforce housing. When you look at the bottom line of, uh, of what hits the wallet uh, of, of the average household income, you have to look at uh, employment, you're, and you have to look at transit as part of the formula for where housing needs to go. So if there is any opportunity to develop uh, affordable housing, essential services housing in the city, um, it is very suitable to be looking in this area where there is opportunity for a future transit location. And from a, de from a developer's perspective, to build that, that essential service unit or that workforce unit is gonna cost almost as much as it does a market rate unit. So what the developer, and, and a lot of communities, some, some will call it inclusionary zoning, um, where they set aside eight, 10, 12% of, of, the, the, uh, of a proposed project as essential service housing, essential services. Um, because it costs almost as much for a developer to do that as it does a market rate unit, developers are saying this isn't financially feasible for us to provide this, this number of units so what, the, what is the quid pro quo? So oftentimes municipalities will, off, will offer density bonuses because there is a public benefit accruing to the municipality in the provision of the essential services housing. So. Yes. Um, currently FEC is running, what, 15 trains a day on the track. And with Brightline, we're talking about 32, adding 32 more trains to that corridor. If we're gonna have a tri-rail station and you say you're looking at service one an hour, is that in each direction? So is it two trains in an hour going up and down? So that comes to about 70 or 80 trains that are gonna be going through the corridor every single day. What's the impact on our roadways? Because we have a tremendous number of uh, roadways that go across the, the train tracks. Right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so, <coughs> uh, so the, um, uh, so, one of the things that's important to think about is that passenger trains operate very, very differently than freight trains. So freight trains are larger and they're slower um, and they take much longer to clear a grade crossing. So when you sit at a light, sometimes the train comes and it could be a two minute crossing, it could be a four minute crossing. 
Passenger trains are much faster and lighter. Uh, the Bright Line trains clear the intersections in about 27, uh, 27 seconds, 29 seconds, versus two, three, four minutes. So it's a much faster moving train. Uh, tri rail trains clear the, grade, uh, clear the intersection in about 45 seconds. So when those trains go through, it's less than a minute. Um, and that's less than a red light cycle, just to give you an idea of how those things correlate. Freight trains are larger, slower, they don't travel as often. Um, they take much longer to clear the intersection. Um, and, so, um, and so the impact on the transportation network, there will be more trains, right? But it's not the same type of train. It's a much smaller, lighter train. Um, the Brightline trains have two engines, so they start and stop much more quickly. They're lighter gauge, um, and they're able to, uh, um, uh, to clear the intersection more quickly. Tri-rail trains are the same um, tri uh, versus freight. So the impact is there will be more trains on this corridor. Uh, the FEC has the right to operate them. Um, and, so, um, and so that's just a balance. Um, the, uh, um, the, challenge for, um, the challenge for us as we try to think about it is um, whether or not the, we just want a, a network that has more cars, which are also going to create a different impact on, on, the, on the transportation network, or if we want to have a better balance. So what other regions do uh, as they grow is create more choices because then there's more opportunity to move more mobility and more connectivity means a better economy. Um, and it means people have choices and they have different ways they can move about. Um, so it's all part of the balance. Um, and um, I don't know if there's anything I, I, well, to add I, that. I'll chime in. Uh, and that, that answer was great. You know, I do want to point out that, you know, I, ironically, one of the, the biggest design challenges that we have uh, in this station planning platforming exercise is is the flyover itself uh, because it causes through its ramps you have this great separation so through the evolution uh, of the design of the station and getting to the platform that is certainly one of the challenges that we have to get to but to your point is that the largest intersection uh, of course is PGA Boulevard and that flies over and so really you know we are in the city of Palm Beach Gardens we have we have four crossings Donald Ross Hood Road, Lighthouse, and Kyoto, um, but PGA because it flies, which is the major intersection. You know, you yeah. don't you don't actually have that uh, conflict uh, like other cities have. Uh, but certainly, um, that positive situation on that uh, 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 that conflict does it provide a design challenge ultimately when we comes to that when it comes to that point on designing the platform connection itself. Okay. Yeah. Other questions? And back. Uh, the perspective of this project that's being proposed uh, with the Trilo station, uh, I would assume that down the study with the traffic uh, behavior and the amount of traffic that's going to be affected, the, the traffic light signaling and all that. Yep. I work with a DOH agency and I've been working on mobile sources and mission inventory, but one of the things we, we always promote is to make sure that they, uh, projects like these, you want to reduce the amount of vehicles being queued up and sitting around and and everything has to be, I, I would assume that the traffic signal is going to be changed around the whole area that's going to be affected. And I assume a study was being made on that, correct? Right. So that, that type of, um, that type of traffic engineering is, um, is part of the project as it gets developed. And so, and so traffic light synchronization, for example, and making sure everything is as efficient as possible is part of how these projects get implemented. Absolutely. Yeah. So you have the least amount of delay as possible. Questions? Yes, sir. Don, I think you need to back up this way. So you're saying that whether this project gets approved or not, the train's going to run through it anyway? Well, th this project is the city's tri rail station. Um, uh, that, is a, uh, that is separate from Brightline, right? So there's three different operators on the corridor. Uh, FEC runs its freight service. Brightline runs its passenger rail service, and this project is looking at tri-rail service, which is a little different. Um, the Brightline has already received all the approvals necessary, and it's finishing up its financing. So they're going to begin construction. Uh, I mean, they, they've suggested they'll begin construction in December. I actually think it's probably January, February before they, be, they actually start to lay the additional track. Um, but that service is absolutely moving forward based on everything that we've seen. Um, and so... Uh, once that happens, uh, the tri-rail service would follow a couple of years later if that is what c folks want to have happen. It's going to be a local, it will be a, a decision that's made by the city and its residents and its, um, and its property owners um, as well as others in Palm Beach County. And, and financing and funding as well, exactly. 
So that's really a little different, frankly, from a lot of the recommendations that we have in the report. Really, what, the, what we recommend with the land use pattern and the analysis are strategies for the city to be more successful financially, um, to have a more efficient pattern of development, um, to, uh, to be able to reduce some of the commuter traffic, um, and increase uh, uh, and better balance the kind of the tax flow, if you will, in the city. Those recommendations are actually a little separate from the from the train. When we when we talk about TOD, there's the the T is the train, but the OD, the oriented development, is all that other stuff that's happening. So what we would suggest to you after doing the analysis is these are strategies that are begin good to begin today. In fact, begin yesterday um, to uh, to to better balance the land use pattern and the transportation network. So. I'm sorry, would you bring up the slide again that shows the crossover from the tri-rail track now to the aerial. FEC track? Yeah. The, uh, the, the aerial? Yeah. Because it, it shows, and it, it also point out, why don't you point this out guy? some of the, uh, nope, uh, go down. One of the renderings, maybe? The rendering that had the train stations themselves and the tracks. In the beginning, I think it's this guy. No. No, the whole, the, from Miami to, from, from Miami oh, to here. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. That's Too okay, the station map, the station <laughs> map, okay. Trying and can, to and you, could, can you point again out there, on there, where the crossover will be from the, you, I know where Mon Mangonia Park is. Okay, so that's gonna be where people can cross over. So I remember in, in uh, TPA, we've talked about the different options of traveling on tri-rail mm -hmm. and whether, and we haven't worked any of this out yet, was whether we are going to have an express over to Mangonia Park or was it going to cross over? You could go to Mangonia Park if you wanted to or you could cross over if you wanted to. So right. we haven't worked any of that out yet because we haven't gotten the stations yet. Right. But um, what you see is where, the, where it crosses over right there and then you can see, I can't see that. Let's see, so yeah. it's Jupiter, so Palm Jupiter. Beach, Lake, Palm Beach Gardens, Lake Park, Riviera Beach, which is around 13th, right? Around yep. the uh, port area there? Correct. And St. Mary's, which is 45th Street. St. Mary's, okay. And, and the black across. right there is where the tri uh, where Brightline is right now. The Correct. black spot right there is, that's Brightline, okay. So that does that help people understand where these stops are going to be and the importance of why we need them? Sure, okay. I think so. I mean, this is how, this is how we connect our city to everything else that's happening. So, so if you're FPNL, for example, and 40% of your employees are coming up from Miami, those employees can take the train. Uh, they don't have to drive. So when you think about rush hour morning and evening, right, when those employees are leaving, which that's really the more obvious rush hour time frame, um, th when you have those other choices, people tend to take those other choices because they don't want to drive either. Sure, but I'm also considering the people from west coming from Avenir parking their car at that station and then going south to Miami. That's possible. So yeah. there's your increase in traffic. So could be, could be an increase, or, or they could take Uber or Lyft, or they could get dropped off. So um, Avenir does not have, based on the price points that we're aware of, likely as high a ridership demand <coughs> um, as maybe some other uh, areas within the city. Um, so there is a correlation between those price points and ridership. So Palm Beach Gardens, what's interesting is um, because Palm Beach Gardens has such a large employment base, it's really a very significant destination station. So, because that's, that's what we think is probably the higher ridership component. Like Boca has similar characteristics in that uh, Boca has inbound commuters in the morning, right, and outbound in the afternoon. And most of the ridership in Boca at the station, it's the highest ridership station in the whole tri-rail corridor. Most of those aren't people getting on the train and riding from Boca out. Most of them are people that are coming into Boca to go to work. Um, and so that's how um, that benefit is uh, felt, right? The roadway network has that many fewer riders, thousands of people that are coming by train to go to work instead of driving in every day. So there's a relationship. And one more thing about, about the station in the gardens and one of our hopes is that there'll be a circulator of some kind that last mile that will, so you don't need a car, you get off and the circulator will take you to 
downtown at the gardens, the gardens, mall, legacy, place, the college, the courthouse, city hall. So you don't need a car. You'll get on the circulator and the circulator will take you around. And, and as and you hospital, said, the how, and the work. hospital also. Right. And how many jobs are right on that corridor, did you say? Within the corridor, 24,000. Okay, so that's basically. 23, 24,000 jobs. Okay, so you're looking at you know 40,000 trips, right? Yeah, well, in right. both directions. Both directions, so, there you go. Yeah. And I do want to add, you know, the city is working on a parallel initiative uh, above and beyond the station planning exercise on a comprehensive citywide master plan for mobility. So the mayor's reference uh, f for a circulator is uh, kind of touching on what Kim mentioned earlier, where we're, we're pivoting specifically away on the impact fee model that focuses exclusively on vehicles, and we're rechanneling it toward all modes of traffic. So there, are, there really is potential funding sources in the future for the city from developer paid money to be able to, for example, purchase a, uh, you know, a small fleet of circulating um, electric vehicles that will circulate within that one mile radius to help with that last mile. I mean, that really is a reality that we are planning for in the future. So, uh, you know, really it's that last mile, whether, whether it's Uber or Lyft or a circulator, uh, that, can, that can also help with uh, tremendously with uh, alleviating traffic conditions in and around the station. And I think the loop we identified in the report, the report actually has a, um, a uh, route uh, to consider that's about a 15-minute route. Yes. And then that 15 minutes, you touch all the major employers that are in that district. Mm -hmm. College, uh, hospitals, of course, the retail, the hotels. The county government center. Yep. Right. Yep. Biotech hub. Yep. Well, and Palm Beach Gardens is very spread out, so I think one of the comments about coming from Avenir, and when you think of some of the northern spots, there's a massive parking lot around the train. Uh, but I think people will be accustomed to taking some type of public transportation, whether it's Uber or Lyft, from PJ National, from Mirasol, from Avenir, to the station, if that's where they have to go. Otherwise, you know, people, if they're working and living on the western corridor, well, they'll still jump on the turnpike and go where they got to go. Not everybody's going to be taking the train, sure. but if you have to come that way, you know, you want to try to create. And, and this is where technology, as we go forward, driverless cars, mm -hmm. how is that going to impact people getting from the western community or the eastern communities to the station. So. Sure. Like in the Boca model, Boca has, gosh, 21 shuttles that connect to the tri-rail station mm -hmm. that are mostly taking folks from that station to work. Some of those are funded by the city. Some are funded by employers because it's to their benefit. Tri-rail operates a full program um, of shuttle service that connects to the station. So wherever there's demand, they work with those employers um, and uh, – um, and they are synchronized to the train service. So the train comes in, the shuttle is there, onto the shuttle they go, and they never have a car. So that car comes off the roadway network altogether, and one shuttle is replacing 10 or 15 or 20 vehicles. One thing we pride ourselves on in the gardens, too, is our green space, and the infill is actually on concrete already, so it's not like we're getting rid of the green space that's in existence. Absolutely. So that's an important note yeah, because excellent point, Mayor. So we do have over 50% green space. And they could have green roofs, which is what we're seeing. So. You can actually create green space on top of the residential. All right, well, last question, sir. <laughs> Palm Beach Gardens uh, looks at this from a profitability standpoint, but do the, does the federal government and the state government look at this at the same way, or do they just give the funding? No, that's a, that's a great question that you ask. Um, the reason we're doing this plan for the city is because the Federal Transit Administration, which is the agency that funds these systems, knows if we don't get our land use right, we won't have successful service. Um, and so this grant came specifically from FTA because the region is looking at tri-rail service being extended so that we could frankly get our act together when it comes to land use. We don't have a land use pattern right now in the city that makes a lot of sense for transit. That's why rush hour feels like it does. Um, and so. Uh, this, uh, the FTA grant, FTA is the acronym for that agency, uh, allowed us to do the station area planning work in seven of the 30 communities that are, gonna, that are identified for potential stations. If we don't get our land use patterns right, we actually won't rank high enough to get the funding. Um, and so it's very competitive, and the, and the, um, the federal criteria that, uh, um, that determines whether or not stations, uh, systems get built looks at land use, looks at the infill pattern over time and the trend in those, in those, um, in those communities. Um, and so they don't fund systems in locations where the land use doesn't make any sense. It doesn't correspond. If there's just stuff that's built but not connected, 
and actually doesn't allow those communities to rank high enough to get the funding to put anything else in. So those communities kind of fall, it's sad, but it, and those are places that fall further and further behind because there's no way to get out of that, trans, that land use imbalance and, and the congestion that comes from that. Um, so, so the long answer to a short question is absolutely, there's a very clear focus on land use patterns, doing this type of planning and putting policies in place to encourage infill. Uh, again, one of the benefits that, that we would suggest, both in the city of Palm Beach Gardens as well as the other communities we, we've been working in, these are strategies that make sense today. Whether there's a train tomorrow, or a train in five years, a train in 10 years, infill housing to help house essential services employees and folks working in Palm Beach Gardens, that's a really good idea. The market wants to bring it and it will make traffic better. Um, and it makes your businesses more viable because now folks aren't driving necessarily all of them, 45 to 60 minutes to get to work. Instead, it's either a short drive or no drive because they're already living closer to their jobs. So these are strategies that make sense today, whether regardless of the timing of tri-rail coming or not. Uh, the mayor, as the mayor was mentioning, I didn't want to paraphrase for you, Mayor. As I said, this where this infill is does not affect the homeowners that have single-family detached homes uh, further out. Exactly. That's it's one not going to change their way of life at all. Absolutely. That's and, and but what it does is it makes the destination along PGA more competitive because now there's housing to help support those retail businesses that we know are going through transition. So it actually keeps the what is the the main street for Palm Beach Gardens more active um, and more economically successful going forward. And, and if I can add to that, while, while we're discussing that, you know, really when you're looking at a sustainability model for being able to maintain uh, the tax rate and being able to maintain high levels of service, uh, th this is a model because you're providing a huge influx of revenue into the city's core, uh, creating substan a steady stream of, of, of revenue for the city to be able to provide services and a relatively low cost for the city to be able to provide. You don't have to build new roads. You don't have to build... Uh, new capital infrastructure, it, it's there. So, I mean, if you look at all of the science, uh, this is a very, very, very profitable way that the city can maintain high levels of service for the residents without having to look at in uh, tax increases in the future. One other comment based on experience with other transit quarters. Um, when we've asked developers in transit quarters and other places, what do you want to get a project done? I was sort of surprised they haven't said give us money, although they frequently say give us money, but sometimes they say give us predictability. What we need the most is a predictable process and plan by which we can do what we do. Don't lead us down one path and then shift gears or go in another direction. The, the benefit we had, and this was the other part of the story I forgot to mention earlier, we had a very strong, as you're setting up here, a series of public workshops to say what do we really want this to be collectively? What kind of city do we want to have? Let's look down the line, and once you have that plan that's acceptable and accepted, that becomes public policy. The market will catch up, and in our case, in a strong, ongoing market that was growing rapidly, that at a national scale, Washington grew enormously, it took the market 25 years to catch up with that original vision. Until the market was there, it didn't happen. So we all sort of got together and said, this is the kind of way we want this to occur, but nobody had to subsidize it. It happened as the market came around and the private market segment said, we're willing to commit. We benefited by it, but we didn't have to subsidize it. So we got our single family houses protected. The density came when it was ready to come, but nobody had to push it because they knew what was predictable. The vision never changed. That shared vision that people had adopted didn't change because it was a reasonable one, but the market took a while to catch up. So this is not going to be an overnight transformation. We're talking about likely decades, as you've said, and that's okay. That's the way the best kind of organic growth occurs. Okay. All right. I think we are wrapping up for this evening. Uh, I do want to remind you all that this meeting has been live streamed, so it will be available on the city's web website, www.pbgfl.com for those of you who wish to uh, view it again, uh, recap on some of the important information. The PowerPoint presentation uh, is also posted, uh, which has the slides presented from this morning, and the entire report is on the city's website. Uh, our contact information is also available. Uh, 
this is an ongoing process, and, and so we are, we are not finished with this. We are going to continue to work on this. There are policy decisions to be made, uh, and there are codes to be looked at to ensure compatibility with some of these. Uh, we want to keep the residents uh, and the entire community engaged as we have throughout this entire process. So we really we thank you all for taking the time to, to be here tonight. Uh, to learn more of what's going on in your community specifically about this TOD initiative, uh, and thank you all so much for being here. Thank you.